me, I, I don't want that power. I want the power to be able to take those coins out of the fish's mouth. <clears throat> you know, I could open up a little bait shop on Lake Conroe. You know, the fish would run. I could take you preachers out there and make your budget for the year. <laughs> the other day I was uh, in the uh, backyard. It was a very clear night, beautiful night. And I looked up into the heavens and, you know, uh, uh, Psalms 19.1 was really true. That the, the, the uh, heavens do declare the glory of God. And at one time, everyone knew that. They knew that uh, where they came from. Uh, they knew the origin of the cosmos. They knew... Uh, purpose and being, why we're here, what our ultimate end is, and so forth. But as you know, man did not like to retain God in his knowledge. And in time, all this was forgotten. Now, Israel certainly uh, continued to uh, know this. Of course, they had a lot of lapses in obedience, but they, they still knew this. But nevertheless, people still looked up at the heavens and tried to explain where these things came from, the mechanics of how all this worked, uh, their purpose in being here, and, and where they came from, and what their ultimate end was. They still did this. All this uh, postulation kind of coalesced into a uh, field of philosophical study called cosmology. Now, a standard definition of cosmology is a system of beliefs that seeks to describe or explain the origin and structure of the universe. A cosmology attempts to establish an order, harmonious framework that integrates time, space, and planets, stars, and other celestial phenomena. In so-called primitive societies, cosmologies also uh, help explain the relationship of human beings to the rest of the universe and are therefore closely tied to religious beliefs and practices. In modern industrial societies, cosmologies seek to explain the universe through astron astronomy and mathematics. Metaphysics, that's just things beyond the physical also play a part in the formation of cosmology. So uh, we have cosmologies that is really a, an effort to explain non-contingent uh, first cause, or as, as we sometimes say, the uncaused first cause. So it, it tries to explain that, the, uh, uh, how it resulted in the creation of this universe, how things living and non-living uh, fitness creation, why we or all other things exist, and what is the ultimate end of, of the universe. And you may recall Paul when he was speaking to the, uh, the uh, Greek philosopher from uh, Mars Hill. Uh, he tried to correct their false cosmology by proclaiming to them the God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth. Now, as I say, uh, people tried to explain the cosmology, how things work, and certainly the most renowned, not the only ones, but the most renowned uh, theories advocated in this particular area were by the Greek philosophers, and they started many, many years ago. And the most famous of these Greek philosophers uh, was uh, Plato and his student Aristotle. And they formulated what was called a, uh, what we call a geocentric uh, model of the cosmos. And they depicted that in their writings, uh, this basic, uh, basic elements of this cosmology uh, consisted of a spherical, but stationary Earth at the center of the universe. Uh, the planets, sun, and stars revolve around the Earth. Now this model was uh, uh, formalized and standardized by Claudius. Ptolemaeus in the second century A.D. Uh, it was this Ptolemaic model that uh, uh, of the cosmos that held sway for a thousand and five hundred years, and perhaps through the efforts of Thomas Aquinas, um, whether he intended or not, I don't think he was a evolutionist, but whether he intended or not, uh, this worldview was held by the Catholic Church until the 19th century, until the early part of the 1800s. Now, a recognized problem with this uh, uh, Ptolemaic system was it was absolutely 
bewildering in its complexity as to explain all the various movements of the, uh, of the uh, planets. Now, Nicholas Copernicus uh, believed that a heliocentric model of the, having the Earth and planets revolve around the sun explained the apparent observations of planetary movements uh, with greater simplicity and compactness than did the uh, geocentric model. But you have to keep in mind that uh, Copernicus uh, wrote and studied during the time of the, the, the uh, uh, ascendancy or the, the uh, height of power of the Catholic Church. So he didn't just publish this to everyone. He was fearful of the uh, ramifications of that, so he just sent his conclusions to just a few people in his uh, work, Little Commentary. It was not until almost 30 years later that he published this uh, on the revolutions of the celestial orbs. And uh, it was not well received, of course, by the Catholic Church. In fact, uh, Martin Luther and John Calvin both rejected this. And in time, the Catholic Church censured this work, and they didn't finally remove the censorship fully until 1828. In uh, September the 20th, 1519, Capitan General Ferdinand Magellan set sail out of the Spanish port of San Lucor de Barrameda with uh, five very small boats. Uh, he was not able to engage the services of qualified uh, mariners, qualified people. Uh, his mode of operation, is he was very uh, secretive. He did not disclose a lot of things. He did not tell people what he was doing or what he had in mind. Didn't tell them where he was going. Uh, did not include them in any uh, conversations about all of this. You know, he could have been an elder somewhere. I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> but nevertheless, he uh, overcame immense opposition. Even his captains muted, muted against him. Uh, nevertheless, in spite of all this opposition, he discovered the strait that now bears his name, the Strait of Magellan. And he passed through the strait and, and uh, proceeded on across the Pacific Ocean, eventually landing in, in Guam, and it was in the Philippines that uh, uh, Magellan died. I think he was conducting a men's business meeting at the time. <clears throat> but the ex ex expedition didn't die. Uh, one ship continued on and finally arrived at the port of San Lucar on Saturday, the 6th of September, or so we thought. Antonio Pigafetta, the uh, expedition diarist, he had kept a meticulous diary, a daily journal. And that was very common of mariners at that time because uh, those that came after them uh, wanted to, to know about you know, where they'd been. And according to this journal, it was the sixth. The Spaniards of San Luca insisted that it was Sunday the 7th of September. And Picapetta uh, confirmed this data with Francisco Albo, the Victoria's pilot. He also kept a daily log. According to Albo, it was the 6th. But in reality, it was the 7th. No one had anticipated this riddle. And after decades, it was finally determined that the Copernicus was right. The heliocentric model was correct. The Earth was revolving every 24 hours, and since they embarked on a westerly heading against the rotation of the Earth, they lost a day in the circumnavigation of the Earth. Now, I wonder whether they, they lost a day or gained a day. I wasn't real sure, but then I thought, well, this is assumed, for example, they showed up in port on April the 15th. They're going to file the return, and they find out it was April the 16th, so they're late, so they lost a day. <clears throat> it's amazing how, amazing how those accountants come up with these things. Anyway, the damage done to the uh, geocentric model was uh, absolutely enormous. Now, in time, of course, given the communication of that day, 
in time, the uh, Romish Pope learned of this uh, uh, circumnavigation and the discrepancy in dates. Now, the Roman Catholic Church had long held the view that when observed experience conflicted with orthodoxy, and that, that's their view, their, their false interpretation of Scripture, then observed experience must yield. To them, the heliocentric model uh, of cosmology ran counter to historically interpreted Scripture. They said, quote, according to the Holy Office in Rome, declared that the notion of a moving earth circling the sun was philosophically foolish and absurd and formally heretical, and inasmuch as it expressly contradicts the doctrines of Holy Scriptures in many places, both according to their literal meaning and according to the common exposition and interpretation of the Holy Fathers and learned theologians. And so it was for 28 successive popes. Now, at the beginning of the 17th century, uh, a fellow named of Galileo, uh, with his improved telescope, he observed many undiscovered stars, galaxies, moons. He discovered the rings of Saturn, and, uh, and more than that. Now, he fully embraced the Copernican cosmology and further refined it. His trouble, of course, began in earnest when he talked about the theories of Copernicus as proved. This brought him in conflict with the congregation of the Holy Office, which was the Inquisition. On February 26, 1616, the Inquisition admonished him on pain of imprisonment not to teach or defend his theories. On March 5th, the Holy Office of the Inquisition published a historical prop proclamation, the view that the sun stands motionless at the center of the universe is foolish, philosophically false, and utterly heretical, because contrary to Holy Scripture. The view that the earth is not the center of the universe and even has a daily rotation is philosophically false and at least an erroneous belief. So Galileo, uh, you, know, you have to understand the Catholic Church back then, you either acquiesced, acquiesced or you may not be alive very long. So he acquiesced. Nevertheless, he continued to advance his Copernican uh, views and 17 years later was tried and pronounced guilty by the Inquisition. He was made to kneel and repudiate the Copernican theory. And on leaving the trial chamber, uh, legend has it anyway, it's not, we don't know that he did this, but legend have it, has it that he muttered and yet it moves. Now, Scripture correctly interpreted harmonizes with science, as we shall uh, later define. It's not far-fetched to assert that Scripture correctly interpreted and science properly defined would have been mutually supported. However, because of the inflexibility of the Roman Catholic Orthodoxy in light of observed uh, observations demanding a opposite conclusion, Science gained an ascendancy with respect to scripture. John Gary Williams wrote this uh, piece, the dark ages which for so long had kept people in religious and scientific error were swiftly passing. There was a spirit of extensive and free inquiry opposed to the authoritative methods of the Catholic Church. One of the evil effects of this darkened period was that the ironclad hand of Catholicism had become synonymous with religion and the Bible. And it was this distorted view of religion against which many had been rebelling. Men were thinking for themselves, reaching out for something which they could hold. Study and research were expanding in every direction, and by the late 18th century, a great many changes had taken place. The so-called age of reason had dawned during this time. Some became carried away with intellectualism and natural philosophy. Such men were prone to be skeptical of almost anything religiously oriented, seeking to satisfy their minds uh, elsewhere. It was in the midst of this atmosphere that the modern concept of evolution emerged. It also seems that in this atmosphere, most nominally Christian religions, namely Roman Catholic, Protestant, and even many in the Lord's Church, have embraced the false concept of so-called theistic evolution. Now, what is a theistic evolution? Well, in its uh, various forms, it's just an amalgamation of evolution and creation, uh, creationism. 
it supposes evolution to be true, yet God created um, matter and used evolution to further develop it. The theistic evolution, though they uh, profess a belief in God, must accept the basic assumptions of evolution regardless of the implications against a special creation. A creator is not essential to the evolutionary process regardless of their assertions to the contrary. The best that a theistic evolutionist uh, can allow is to provide for a creator. They cannot sustain an argument for the necessity of a creator if evolution is indeed a fact. Uh, Batchel, uh, Barrett Baxter defined theistic evolution this way. The theistic evolutionists hold a position somewhat between that of the absolute uh, evolutionist and the creationist. He believes that God created the materials of our universe and then guided and superintended the process by which all life has evolved from the simplest one cell form on up to the sophisticated forms which we know today. Evolution was God's method of bringing about the present development, though originally the materials were created by God. Now there are two types of uh, evolution. There's cosmic evolution, and that supposes the development of the cosmos from the chaos of a Big Bang or whatever else it may be. Now evolutionists do not propose that matter and energy came in, into existence with the Big Bang. In fact, they do not have any idea as to how these things came into existence. And uh, there was this evolution of the cosmos, according to cosmic evolution, until it got to the point where life was to begin. And organic or biological evolution has to do with the development of life from its beginning. You know, it, it picks up where orga uh, cosmic evolution ends. Uh, evolutionists, again, don't have any idea as to how life originated from inorganic matter. They don't have any idea. And, but organic evolution has to do with, you know, development of life from the, the beginning to uh, more advanced forms and ultimately uh, man. And of course, uh, evolutionists maintain that these processes are still continuing even today. And let's talk about uh, uh, science for a moment. Evolution is often referred to as the theory of evolution. That, however, is an inaccurate representation since the basic assumption of evolution do not conform to the principles of scientific theory. Uh, there are essentially three kinds of science, although, well, let me, let me go ahead and add about the uh, uh, theory. The theories are, uh, must be able to be falsified, uh, otherwise it's not a theory. And theories are never empirically verifiable. If it is possible to be, to be refuted by experimentation or observation, but it's not after repeated efforts, it then becomes a natural law. Uh, the law of gravity, for example, can be falsified by experimentation and observation. Now, the way to do this is to take an apple and you drop that apple. Well, it falls. But you do keep doing that for, um, you know, a thousand times, a million times, a billion, a hundred billion times. You keep dropping that apple. If one time it falls up rather than down, then you falsified the law of gravity or the theory of gravity. You falsified it. But it always, it has always fallen. So once you, uh, uh, experimentation concludes that it's always going to fall, then it becomes a, a natural law. Well, let's talk about uh, snowflakes. Now, no two snowflakes, at least from observation, are identical. And all are six-sided. Now you can falsify this by examining all the uh, snowflakes and you find two that are exactly alike or one that is either a five-sided or a seven-sided, then you disprove that, uh, that natural law. So these things can be invalidated. Um, theorems must be able to be tested time and time again. And if it cannot be tested by experiment, or observation, then it is not a valid theory. Any so-called theory that is so constructed that it cannot be falsified is not a theory at all, 
but it's rather a philosophical doctrine, and such is the case with evolution. There are three, essentially three kinds of science, uh, at least the way I can classify them. I know uh, most people would classify the first two that I'm going to talk about as one kind of science. But the first is a pure or exact science such as mathematics. Two plus two always equals four. Unless you're in the accounting profession, then sometimes we ask, what do you want it to equal to? <laughs> but in mathematics, two plus two always equals four. Now there is another kind of science called a process or structural science. Water, H2O, H2O is a result from the burning of hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, these kinds of science deal with regularities. Things that happen, or at least can happen, repeatedly. The last kind of science is the historical interpretive, or sometimes called the uh, observational interpretive. It deals with singularities. Now, you'll hear these terms uh, when talking about evolution and uh, cosmic evolution and, or creation, what have you, singularities and regularities. Singularities are one-time, never-to-be-repeated events. For example, there was doing, during the 1860s a little event called the American Civil War. It will never be repeated. There may be another American Civil War, but it's not going to be that one. It'll be a different one. The creation of the universe and beginning of life are singularities. They will never be repeated. In their handbook on Christian evidences, uh, when uh, skeptics asked, Geisler and Brooks had this to say about uh, science. Science is, is based on causality. Every event has a cause. Even if we can't know this specifically what particular cause produced a, a, a certain event, we can say what kind of cause it must have been because of the kinds of effects that we see today. The idea that whatever caused some effect in the past will cause the same effect and the present is called the principle of uniformity. All science is based on finding causes using these two principles, causality and uniformity. A primary cause was a first cause that explained singularities, events that only happened once and had no natural explanation. Secondary causes were thought of as natural causes and laws that govern the way things normally operate, Erroneous conclusions will ensue if singularities are subjected to exact or structural science examination. This is precisely what has happened in the case of evolution. That is, evolution seek to explain singularities as a result of secondary causes. Just as it, as it is wrong for the Roman Catholic Church to use supernatural causes to explain natural events, it is just as wrong for the evolutionist to use secondary causes to explain singularities. If evolution can be called a science of the historical interpretive kind, then creationism can also be called a science of the same kind. Both ex uh, seek to explain singularity. Neither should use exact or structural science. Neither should, uh, should seek to give definitive answers, that is, answers that may be confirmed by experimentation over and over again but they only seek, or should only seek, to provide plausible uh, causes. Now, the evolutionist uh, quibbles that everything has a cause, and God is part of everything, so God must have a cause. That's not what we're saying here. Every event has a cause, not everything. Anything that has a beginning has a cause. God has no beginning, so God has no cause. Do evolutionists agree with this in principle? Well, yes, they do. For them, matter is eternal. Matter has no beginning, and matter has no end. So they at least uh, accept that in, in principle. Is there a problem with Genesis? Well, there is a problem with Genesis. Anyone having a grain of common sense can see that the plain reading of Genesis is in conflict with the principles of evolutionary thought. Somehow these 
ever irreconcilable differences must be reconciled. Uh, how may, may it be done? There's only one approach available to the individual. I don't care if it's the, uh, uh, if, you know, whoever it is. The, we're talking about theistic evolutionists. But anybody that wishes to embrace evolution as factual and maintain a belief in the all-powerful God uh, somehow has to reconcile this. As a writer named John Rendell Short made this suggestion, theistic evolutionists generally agree that God has revealed all that can be known of the world and man in two books, the book of nature and the book of scripture. Since both originate with God, they must be compatible. There can be no final disagreement. Evolution, they believe, is scientifically is a scientifically accepted fact, uh, provided uh, Grant Rousseau that God, not chance, was in control. Theistic evolutions are well aware that in Genesis 1 and 2, the creation of man is recorded as having taken place in six days after the beginning. They also know that according to evolution, man was created millions of years after their origin of life. Here is the discrepancy. How to resolve it? Since there can be no discordance between the book of nature and the book of scripture, and since both appear true, the error, they feel, must lie in the interpretation and understanding of the Genesis account. Carl Drews, he's also a theistic evolutionist, uh, he expressed a similar view, view. I believe that God Almighty created the heavens and the earth and all life upon the earth. He accomplished this process over billions of historical years. He has been in charge of this process since the beginning of time, and he still is in charge. He directed the unfolding of life forms over time that many people call evolution. So what are the first 11 chapters of Genesis before Abraham? Either all these scientific disciplines are wrong or we're reading and interpreting our Bible wrong. As Christians, we do not permit the Bible to lie, but we do permit it to be non-literal. As we have seen in the history of the Roman Catholic Church, it is certainly the case that Scripture wrongly divided has been used to refute that which is really discernible in nature. To the other extreme, uh, Mr. Uh, Reynolds, Short, and Drews, well as well as all uh, theistic evolutionists, hold to the paramountcy of the reported fact of evolution over Scripture rightly divided, uh, divided. As Mr. Drews has asked, so what of the first 11 chapters of Genesis? Now the serious advocate of theistic evolutionists as well as everyone else, they were uh, biblical creationists, must ask this question. Don Stewart, in his article, What is Theistic Evolution?, had this to say, and he quoted other uh, individuals. Uh, theistic evolutionists do not hold to a literal reading of the text of Genesis. They believe that Genesis is allegory, poetry, or saga. Scientists Walter Hearn and Richard Hendry wrote, the authors of this chapter consider the expressions of Scripture regarding the creation of life to be sufficiently figurative to imply little or no limitations on prob uh, possible mechanisms. Two other writers, Vernon Blackmore and Andrew Page, conclude, it is mistaken to treat the first chapter of Genesis as science. It is a literary statement of the universal lordship of God and mankind's utter dependence on him. It is a story of the wonder of our creation, yet the awfulness of our rebellion. Genesis then rings true as ever, whether one follows an evolutionary account of biological origins or not. So uh, there, there we have it, you know, uh, in order for theistic evolution to harmonize with Genesis. Genesis must be relegated to allegory, poetry, or saga. And the word that Mr. Stewart should have included but uh, did not is the word myth, because it's at least implied in there. The problem that Mr. Stewart needs to overcome, along with all uh, who hold to this theistic evolution view, is, a, is that the Bible contains no myth. The New Testament uses the word fable five times. Now, it's translated from the Greek word that we get the word myth, but in each instance of its use, it is condemned. Is a mythical genesis a problem? Now, regardless of what the atheistic evolution may assert, to the contrary, a mythical genesis is indeed a problem. If the first 11 chapters of Genesis are allegorical or mythical, and Jesus himself speaks of them as historical, then Jesus was mistaken. And if that's the case, why should we trust anything that Jesus has said? 
Uh, furthermore, if a theistic evolution can claim that gen Genesis is a, is a myth when it is clearly historical, then anyone can arbitrarily ascribe some meaning to scripture not warranted by some well-established uh, hermeneutical methodology. When that happens, utter chaos uh, ensues. As a matter of fact, that kind of sort of describes the religious world today, doesn't it? And even in the church. The stark fact is the truth, truthfulness of the scriptures and the Christian's reliance thereon as its only guide in scripture matters stands and falls on its historicity. Even the atheist recognizes this. Ken Ham in his article, Couldn't God Have Used Evolution, wrote and quoted Thomas Huxley. Now you may uh, know who Thomas Huxley is. He did more to advocate the theory of evolution than did even Darwin. He's been called Darwin's bulldog. Uh, but he uh, said in his essay, Lights of the Church and Science, I am fairly at a loss to comprehend how anyone for a moment can doubt that Christian theology must stand or fall with the historical trustworthiness of the Jewish scriptures. The very conception of the Messiah or Christ is inextricably, inextricably interwoven with Jewish history. The identification of Jew, uh, Jesus Nazareth with that of the Messiah rests on the interpretation of the passages of the Hebrew scriptures which have no evidential value unless they possess the historical character assigned to them. And Huxley goes on to uh, uh, quote Matthew 19, 4 through 5, And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Huxley commented if divine authority is not here claimed for the 24th verse of the second chapter of Genesis, what is the value of language? And again, I ask if one may play fast and loose with the, fall, the story of the fall as a type or allegory, what becomes of the foundation of Pauline theology? And he quotes uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 21 through 22, for since by a man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead, for in Adam all died, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Thus it continues that if Adam may be held to be no more than a real personage than, than uh, Prometheus, and if the story of the fall is merely an instructive type comparable to the profound Promethean mythos, what value is Paul's dialectic? Thus concerning those who accepted the New Testament doctrines that Paul and Christ teach, but rejected Genesis as literary history, Huxley claimed the melancholy fact remains that the position that they have taken up is hopelessly untenable. I think uh, Huxley uh, correctly uh, articulated the dilemma of the theistic evolution. If one is unwilling to accept Genesis as historical, how may he in all intellectual honesty accept any concept of the Bible as true? The answers provided as to man's origin, uh, purpose for existing, ultimate destiny, ultimate truth, Bible's authority, and the like, could only then be considered to be relative, varying from individual and individual. What the theistic evolution needs more than anything else uh, is time. Vast amounts of time are needed. Now, there's only three places that they can work time into the Genesis record. That's either before the six days of creation, during the six days of creation, or after the six days creation. And I'm not going to deal with the after because that has to do with the uh, age of the earth. I think Gene Litke is going to uh, be dealing with that. So I'll leave that for now. But let's talk about during the six days of creation, so-called day-age theory. Now, day-age theory, in just a, a summarize, has to do with each day that's each of the six days, uh, there's not, they do not represent 24 hours. They represent vast eons of time. And during this eon of time, God used evolution to kind of bring things along. Now, the problem with this is that uh, on day three, the plants were created. And on day four, the sun was created. Now, if 20, 24 hours of those days were vast eons of time, uh, somehow the plants 
existed for a vast amount of time without sunlight. And let's think about day six. Now, according to this theory, um, Adam was not actually created out of dirt, uh, out of dust. Uh, there was some sort of, you know, man, ape creatures that uh, God was bringing them along in their, their physical development. And at some point in time, he designated one to be uh, the Adam. Now, let's think about this for a moment. <clears throat> you got all these uh, ape creatures running around and uh, some uh, level of development. And God identifies one of them. I don't know how he identifies the one. Maybe they weren't dragging the knuckles like the others were dragging the knuckles. I'm not sure how that works. <laughs> but he, he designated one of them to be Adam and gave that one a spiritual life. Now think about this for a moment. <clears throat> this, this spiritual Adam now, what if he wanted to tell his, uh, I guess, Somebody was a monkey's uncle. I'm not sure how that works, but <clears throat> like his father. Maybe he wanted to tell his father about uh, the God of heaven, but he couldn't do it because his father's an ape. <clears throat> There's also another problem. Uh, Adam, you know, there were no suitable apes available for him. All the ape babes, you know, just didn't look so good anymore. <laughs> <laughs> So God had to select one of the uh, eight babes <laughs> and designate that one to be Eve. Now you all wondered whether uh, Adam and Eve had uh, navels. Now we know <laughs> they had eight navels. <laughs> but that that is the theory, and, and it's it was uh, eventually just rejected because uh, you know the lexical lexical and exegetical exegetical perspective just didn't just didn't work. Now, the next major uh, theory of theistic evolution had to do with the gap theory. And this gap uh, theory, or the gap creation, is also called the ruin restoration creationist. They, they generally hold the view that there were six 24-hour uh, days of creation uh, set forth in the first chapter of Genesis. But how they posit that there existed between Genesis 1 and 1 and Genesis 1 and 2, uh, vast eon, eons of time that accommodate all the geological ages of the so-called geological, uh, geological time column. According to this theory, God created heavens and earth in, in, uh, heavens and earth in, in Genesis 1-1, and then because of some cataclysmic event involving the fall of Lucifer, you know, they, they got that wrong, of course, uh, uh, the initial creation came to ruin and utter chaos, uh, the rest of the Genesis, Genesis chapter describes a second creation, or a restoration, if you will. Uh, that is a, uh, it, it's a description of bringing order out of chaos. And this view, by the way, is more widely accepted in the church than the uh, day-age theory. Now, was the gap theory formulated in order to solve a textual, textual problem with uh, Genesis? Uh, Jack C. Sofiel, a consulting physicist and lecturer on creation and evolution topics, had this to say in the article, The Gap Theory of Genesis, Chapter 1. One important fact should be kept in mind when considering the gap theory. This interpretation of Genesis and associated passages of Scripture was not developed in an effort to solve apparent problems with the end every five minutes. <laughs> It was not difficulties, difficulties of the fall of Satan or the condition of the earth during the six days that precipitated the theory. It was and is an effort to solve the problem of time. Uh, there, the time of the earth's formation, according to natural science, that is evolution, is extremely long and drawn out while the biblical account uh, record uh, describes a relatively recent rapid formation. Uh, there were and still are those who are quite unwilling to make a decisive choice between these two counts and the gap theory. Now there, there's a, a considerable more amount of information that's contained in the manuscript. You'll just have to buy the book and, and get it. Uh, but to sum it up, you know, the, the honest and sincere exegete of Holy Scripture is not like the Roman Catholic Church, uh, which adhered to a 
uh, orthodoxy that's clearly contradictory, <coughs> contradictory to observed uh, phenomena. Uh, neither will this uh, exegete except proclamations from the adherents of the uh, pseudo-science of evolution only because it is, quote-unquote, science. Uh, to such one, facts are not facts until they can be clearly demonstrated to be such. One must not ignore a compelling fact that doctrines of creation and evolution are so strongly divergent that reconciliation is totally impossible. Theistic evolutionists, however, attempt to integrate the two doctrines. Such syncretism, and syncretism is mere, merely a matter of trying to mix oil and water. You just you can't do it. Such a syncretism reduces the message of the Bible to insignificance. The conclusion is inevitable. There is no support for theistic evolution in the Bible, and such philosophical foolishness should be abandoned and must be opposed. Thank you. We got a little preview of the of Ken's lesson a couple of Wednesday nights ago, and the uh, reason we, those of us here at Spring, probably didn't react too strongly to ape babes, we have heard it before. <laughs> but you, you were here for the uh, the coining of a of a, a new expression. It occurs to me, Kenneth. I, I think uh, one of the things you were trying to say is that when theistic evolutionists try to reconcile their views with what the Bible clearly says, they in effect are slapping God in the face and said, you, could, you don't have the power to do it that way. We have to figure out a way that you could have done it. I believe that he could have done it any way he wanted to, but he told us he did it in six days, period. We are going to adjourn now until the top of the hour. We have just a little over five minutes, and uh, we will come back.